I think it is clear to believe in the power of ideas. Fresh thank you to the Manhattan Institute. Uh, this is our second panel. Uh, this is the panel of the Davids. David Moeller, David Diamond, David Dismukes, uh, all PhDs? No, nope, not me. No, not Dr. Mo not, no Dr. Moeller. Uh, Dr. Diamond, Dr. Dismukes. Uh, this panel, uh, the, 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 the caption here is Promise Not Peril, New Technologies in Coal and Nuclear. Uh, as I did before, I won't uh, uh, hit you with the uh, bios of uh, all of the, uh, uh, the presenters. Here, but uh, uh, I'll start with uh, Dr. Uh, David Diamond, who I met at Brook Brookhaven National Lab uh, about a year ago. He's a senior scientist there, expert in uh, all matters nuclear. Uh, and without uh, further ado, uh, Dr. Diamond. Uh, after listening to that first panel, I feel a little bit like an underdog, but I'm going to give you my perspective on nuclear energy and present you with uh, some facts about that particular sector because I think that in spite of the fact that natural gas is more economical in many markets and in spite of the Fukushima catastrophe and in spite of the push for renewables, there still is a, um, uh, a nuclear power sector that continues to grow. Now, it's true that it's uh, primarily in Asia and Central and Eastern Europe but it is very important from a global perspective and therefore important for us. And if you just focus on the US, I think it's still quite significant and uh, should be considered seriously. Um, now, there are many countries that already have an existing nuclear structure that are moving ahead quite rapidly with nuclear energy. And those are countries like China, Russia, India, and South Korea. And then there are other countries that already have a nuclear power infrastructure that are moving ahead hmm, a little bit more slowly. So we have the US, the UK, France, Finland, Ukraine, Brazil, um, but they, they are moving ahead. Then you have many, many other countries that are starting to develop the necessary infrastructure to have nuclear energy. And indeed, some of them already have nuclear projects underway. They're not under constru construction, but these are at the project stage. And examples of this are Vietnam, United Arab Emirates. There, there's that word Vietnam again. Uh, United Arab Emirates, Indonesia, Turkey, and Poland. Now, there are only a few countries, I think, where the Fukushima catastrophe has had a, a, a major impact. And um, beside Japan, of course, and, and that's uh, Germany, Switzerland, and Italy. Well, let me focus now on the situation in the United States. We have 104 operating units here, and it's significant to note that 85 of those units have either completed or are in the process of completing license renewal so that they will operate for 60 years. That's 20 years beyond their original 40-year license. And it's also significant to note that over the last, oh, 10, 20 years, many of them have increased their capacity. So indeed, we have an increase of more than 6,000 megawatts electric of nuclear capacity and another 1,000, more than 1,000 megawatt electric capacity in, in the works. So that's equivalent to saying that over the last, say, 15 years, we've, we've uh, built the equivalent of seven new nuclear power plants in, in this country. Now, in addition to uh, those existing plants, we have four units that are starting construction. These are two in Georgia, two in South Carolina, and one unit in Tennessee, uh, an older unit that is 
um, being completed. There are 12 other units that have applied for licenses to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. However, to be candid, it is not clear when or even if those projects will um, begin as const actual construction projects. Westinghouse is the, um, I'd say that at the top of the list of vendors that are providing these nuclear power plants. It's uh, owned by Toshiba, but the, the work is done by Westinghouse in the, in the United States. Um, other companies that U.S. utilities are seriously considering, considering are Arriva and General Electric Hitachi. Uh, other countries that are uh, on the list in the U.S., but for, further down on the list as, as potential vendors is uh, Mitsubishi and uh, uh, Toshiba by itself. Now, all these countries are active internationally, along with Russian and Korean vendors. Now, the new plants that I just alluded to are, are large, approximately 1,500 megawatts electric each. And they're designed with the latest technology, including enhanced safety. But you should note that there is a parallel path toward nuclear energy that involves plants with capacities less than 300 megawatts electric. And this path seems to be getting wider and wider. That is, there, there seems to be more uh, momentum building in this direction. These are the so-called small modular reactors, and they're being developed in the U.S. by Babcock and Wilcox, by Westinghouse, and by a startup called NuScale. Uh, abroad, there are, there are other companies involved in this particular market. And the market for these plants are, the, are um, smaller markets, obviously. Uh, for example, in isolated areas or in developing countries or for very specific industrial, industrial uses. And indeed, there is a, a serious um, project in Tennessee by TVA to build one of these units. The... Um, uh, expectation is that in 2013 they will be submitting license uh, application. So it's something that is moving ahead. They would build a single unit and then at a later time uh, additional units at a particular site in Tennessee. Uh, now these reactors do not take advantage of economy of scale. So how are they going to compete? Well, the fact that they are small means that they all have some sort of an innovative design. They're not just a scaled-down, large uh, reactor plant. And in addition to innovative design, they have factory construction. And it is hoped that these two factors will make them somewhat competitive with the larger units on a dollar per kilowatt electric installed basis. Another major advantage of these smaller units is the small capital outlay. And for utilities in the U.S., this is a significant factor that uh, raising capital is always uh, problematic. So I, I also wanted to mention that that's what I wanted to say about uh, new things coming along. But I wanted to mention that um, there's considerable amount of work being done also to improve the technology of existing the existing fleet. That is, uh, dollars are, are going into uh, improving the generation of nuclear electricity. Uh, an example of this is the fact that <clears throat> many plants are considering changes from their older analog instrumentation and control systems to newer digital systems. That's, that's just one, one example. Um, another example is the way in which these plants would respond to severe accidents. And the motivation for this is both from pre- and post-Fukushima thinking. So, um, Another movement for improvement to the existing fleet is the fact that there is a joint industry-government program to define the technical justification for increasing the lifetime of these plants for an additional 20 years beyond the 60-year lifetime that they are now licensed for. So this would mean that plants 
um, would be licensed to an 80-year lifetime. So that gives you a little bit about my perspective. Um, I believe the use of nuclear energy is growing. I believe the international community is making sure that the technology that will be used in the future will be advanced relative to what is currently in place. And in the US, I think new plants and improvements to existing plants will ensure that our infrastructure remains strong and ready for even more growth in the, in the future. Uh, thank you, uh, David. Uh, and now, uh, uh, David Dismukes, uh, Center for Energy Studies at uh, Louisiana State University. Uh, I met David uh, oh, three or four years ago and uh, uh, spoke uh, at LSU at some of his students at, uh, in Baton Rouge. And uh, David uh, works frequently for utilities and has a very broad view on uh, the utility business here in the U.S. So, David, please. Thank you, Robert. Good morning, everybody. I think what I'd like to do is, is to talk and, and shift gears a little bit on, uh, in talking about new technologies and maybe play off of some of the things that the first panel talked about, and that is how are we going to add new capacity and what types of technology are we looking at developing from a regulatory perspective and how, more importantly, those are going to get paid for. Because at the end of the day, that is what's most important, right, is what is the cost of developing these energy resources and putting them into rates here in the United States. And so how is that likely to evolve? Uh, you know, we've got a lot of changing energy and environmental regulations that are out there that are very quick, they're relatively expedited, that are going to change the dynamics of our solid fuel base, when I mean solid fuel, nuclear and coal, and it's going to require some capacity additions uh, throughout many areas of the United States. You know, in terms of some background, in terms of the regulatory process, these are big, large, base load, uh, you know, hundreds of millions, if not billions of dollars of investment that are going to have to be securitized, for lack of better words, with some kind of base. And even in states that have retail choice or competition like New York, you're going to have some kind of long-term 30-year contract, or you're going to have some kind of uh, payment schedule that is going to be tied back through an electric distribution company to pay for some of these new technologies that we're looking at. So there's two tracks that we can look at, and that is, moving down the next generation, no pun intended, of generating technologies that are out there that may be nuclear that you've heard about, or they may include things like integrated coal gasification with carbon sequestration. Now, the real big challenge with these is that some of them are relatively new. We haven't built nuclear plants in probably 30 years or so. Uh, the IGCC units that we're looking at are at scales and operation levels that we don't have a lot of experience with but have promise. Uh, but they're very expensive. We're looking at capital cost development in the order of several thousand dollars per KW of installed capacity. Uh, what do we do uh, in terms of the financial responsibilities and the risk associated with that? It may take anywhere from five, seven to ten plus years to develop that. Now, historically, uh, in, in the old vertically integrated utility structure and the traditional rate of return days when we were building many of these baseload assets, the way they were developed was under a paradigm which the utility went in, developed the plans, uh, constructed the facilities. When they were operational, they went to their regulators, they proved that these assets were used and useful, and they got cost recovery for them. They bore the development risk associated with these assets and went to their regulators for cost recovery at such time that they could prove that they had meaning fully uh, contain the costs associated with development and that the asset was actually needed. We're in an entirely different environment right now in a lot of different ways in terms of developing these types of assets. So on a foregoing basis, if we're looking at some of these advanced technologies, who's going to pay for those and who's going to bear the risk associated with that development? And one of the things that you see is it's all of us out there, all the other types of customer classes that share in that responsibility. Uh, even the plants that are, are proposed for nuclear development right now are on a pay-as-you-go basis. That ratepayers are making these contributions to these facilities under the hope and expectation that they will, in fact, eight, five, you know, nine, ten years down the road, will actually come online. Uh, that's a big change from what we've seen in the past and obviously creates a lot of incentive issues associated with cost containment and other things that I won't go into. But it's certainly a big change in risk. And one of the things that regulators are going to have to look at and assess when they're looking at these technologies, yes, they may work, yes, they may have lots of opportunities and promise, but who's going to pay for them and who's going to you know, bear the risk associated with this? You know, in conjunction with all the risks that we're doing right now in terms of developing renewable energy and these big commitments in energy efficiency that we have throughout most of the United States as well, this is just one more thing that we're likely to pile on top of that. So we could go down that road, or we could go down the other road, which is let's just say, take the safe play and let's do 
natural gas generation. If you look at natural gas generation, it's a very proven technology. I can get in and out permitting to start in the generator in 24, 36 months. It's about $1,000, $1,200 a kW. It's a no-brainer, right? And I'm looking at gas prices that Porter was talking about earlier, and I'm thinking, you know, that's the low-risk option. But if we think about that, you think about what Jacob said. For any of you who've worked in this business, you've worked in the merchant power business in the late 90s and the early 2000s, you can't help but kind of smirk a little bit when you hear these comments about been there, done that. And you know, like Yogi Berra said, deja vu all over again. And that's the other thing that I think regulators are concerned about is, well, if we look at all these big base load capacity requirements that we have on a foregoing basis and we do commit to natural gas, are we setting ourselves up again you know, for a similar situation that we saw in that 2001-2002 time period when we started the, the first initial run up on natural gas prices. I don't have a, a big answer for you, unfortunately, today in terms of which the best option is, but I think it is important to think about that, you know, as I tell my students in my economics classes, there is no such thing as a free lunch. And we are going to be in situations, ironically, where we'll see our fuel costs likely to be relatively low and decreasing or flat. One of the great benefits that we've seen with natural gas as well over the last several years has been that they've been amazingly less volatile than we've been used to for the prior um, decade. But we're looking at a relatively big change in energy prices, at least at the electricity level associated with these capital costs. So when we think about fuel availability, we think about fuel costs, that's certainly one piece of that puzzle. But this is a capital intensive industry, and it's those capital costs that are going to matter and how much they cost, who bears the risk of those developments are going to be the really big policy issue when it comes to looking at these technologies. Great. Thank you. Um, and now, finally, uh, David Muller, uh, Chief Technology Officer uh, from Duke Energy. Well, I'm going to break from the pack and try to talk from here. So I, I hope everybody can hear me. If you, if you really can't and you need for me to move, tell me and I will. Uh, Robert, thank you for pulling this together. This has really been fabulous, and, thank, and the, 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 it's daunting to speak last because all the panelists have been so terrific. But when Robert and I spoke, uh, I don't know, several weeks ago now, uh, he was interested in, in having me talk about how kind of a utility sees growth of coal and uh, nuclear domestically. And I just want to mention that this morning, an uh, awful lot of the talk has been about natural gas, not coal or nuclear. And I think that's for a good reason. Shale gas has really kind of changed the equations in some meaningful way ways. We, we really see shale gas resetting the long-run marginal cost uh, of uh, comparative commodities uh, you know, over the long term. However, we don't see it taking volatility out of the equation. And that's a really important thing, I think, because when you look at the over, – over the last 10 years, natural gas has traded, if I've got the numbers right in my head, from a little bit under 2 bucks to $16. So that's a huge volatility, and our customers don't like it. Our customers want to, want to know what their bill's going to be and don't want it to swing a lot. So um, something that we've got to think about in our, in our long-term planning. Uh, we, we see right now the cost of gas being low for a number of reasons, not just technology improvements. That, that certainly is what's resetting the long-run cost curve. But right now we've got weather that's a key component. We've got very high storage volumes. And we've got supply today that really is a result of bullish investments made through 2009. So we've had an awful lot of, of development work and uh, rigs deployed based on previous work, and the, the result is supply today. So at issue today, one of the things that we really worry about at Duke is the potential for gas generation overbuild, and that's been mentioned just, in, just with, uh, with the, the last David, for example. So. Uh, it really makes us think about how do we meaningfully manage a well-balanced portfolio on a go-forward basis. Now, we do think that coal will most likely comprise a decreasing portion of our fleet. In fact, we know it will going forward. We've just, we are just in the process of completing two very large coal-fired coal power plants, new ones, uh, a roughly 800-megawatt power plant in the Carolinas that's a, a supercritical pulverized coal plant and a 630-megawatt IGCC plant in uh, Indiana. Uh, those are probably the last two coal plants that we're going to build for a long time, and that's my personal opinion. Uh, in the meantime, so we've built roughly 1,400 megawatts in the last few years, but we've retired 3,700 megawatts. So we can already see that, you know, coal's backing out as a fraction of our total capacity. And with the price of gas today, it's also backed out over the last couple of years in, in uh, total generation. In fact, in the Midwest today, in fact, I think in the Southeast as well today, uh, our natural gas plants are dispatching before our coal fire plants. And we're actually artificially dispatching some coal plants because of the fact that we have so much coal on the ground that we need to get rid of some of it. <clears throat> Nuclear, unfortunately, is also pretty difficult to build. 
we think the recent approval of the Vogel units is, is really kind of positive, but we got to look at the financial risk of building a nuclear unit. At $6,300 per kilowatt, which is kind of the going freight right now, the financial risk that a utility like us uh, incurs, and, and da the previous David also spoke to this a little bit, uh, can be a really bet the company kind of risk. So you look at $6,300 per kilowatt, a 2,200 megawatt plant, which is two AP1000 units, costs about $14 billion. That's a, a, a very high percentage of even the largest utilities market caps today. So without some kind of pay-as-you-go plan, uh, a, a utility is, is really betting the company to take that kind of a construction risk. Beyond that, at that particular cost, the bus bar cost from a new nuclear plant is about 11 cents per, per kilowatt hour. And meanwhile, at $3 gas, the bus bar from a new combined cycle plant is about 5 cents. So once again, you know, it, when, you just, when you look at those dynamics, it makes it difficult for a utility like ours to argue successfully uh, for maintaining a balanced portfolio because uh, the consumers and the regulators tend to drive toward least costs. You know, it's, it's least cost today. So I, I think, once again, the trap potentially is, is falling into a kind of a, a, a world where we're making instant static decisions based on today's dynamics that will unbalance the portfolio. And from, from our work, it looks like if we get much above 30 percent in any component of our portfolio, you start to really begin to get a little bit unbalanced. If you just look at how how uh, uh, different areas of the country dispatch today, for example, and the prices their customers pay. Now, th the first David on the panel talked about small modular reactors, and I think that's a really exciting thing to look at going forward. I don't think that's going to help us much in the next probably decade, frankly. Uh, domestically, I think domestically the uh, it's going to take a while to get those into the mix. But one of our Chinese partners is in the process of building two small modular high temperature gas cooled reactors uh, right now in Shandong province and they expect to have those online pre Fukushima they were due to be online in 2016 I don't know the new date now but the bottom line is I think we'll have a couple of years of cost and performance data real world cost and performance data on those units before we build anything similar in the US so that should be very interesting to to watch and as the first David also indicated one of the big things that that could do for us is alleviate some of that huge financial risk so instead of rolling the dice on a $14 billion investment, you might be doing a, something much smaller on a more incremental basis that could be much more palatable. Uh, let me stop there. If people have questions, I can talk more about other technologies sure. and sure. global. Well, let me jump in right then uh, there, David, and then we'll open the, uh, a few questions since it's my prerogative to ask him. I'm going to, and then we'll open to the floor. But um, follow up, because I know there's a gentleman here from the DOE. Could you raise your hand? With, uh, yes, you're working on, on uh, high-temperature gas-cooled reactors. So uh, what is the cost per kilowatt uh, construction on those new uh, modular reactors that are gas-cooled now in China? Well, the honest answer is we don't know, and I've asked the question, and I've gotten answers, and I don't believe them. So I want to see, <laughs> I want to see the data. There's there's a real problem when we've talked when we talk to our Chinese partners because the the what they see as costs aren't dollars to dollars, aren't, aren't apples to apples in U.S. terms. I see. Well, let me follow on that because one of the things when I went to Brookhaven, uh, David Diamond and his colleagues and I talked about was the issue of new materials and new material science and and. Uh, uh, Marty Snyder and, and uh, Harold Weitzner are here from NYU, and they've talked about some of these same issues in terms of fusion technology, the, the need for new, uh, new, new material science. Um, but how important, uh, Dr. Diamond, is that in terms of if you're going to pursue high-temperature gas-cooled react, gas reactors, do you need new material science to, to allow for those higher temperatures and pressures, or can you continue using some of the same materials that have been used and proven over time already? What, what, what's the state of, uh, of that relative to the, the, the regular water-cooled modular reactors that you, you've been discussing? Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, the, uh, these advanced high-temperature gas reactors do need new materials, and a lot of research has been done to develop and uh, understand those, those new materials. But as you mentioned, the thrust in the United States with the particular vendors that I mentioned has been on uh, light water reactor technology, which is really uh, an adaptation of the existing technology that we currently have for our reactors, uh, power reactors in the United States. So uh, that technology is, um, um, 
is an evolutionary type of technology. And I think it's something that at, at this point in time would, is more attractive to utilities. Uh, I don't know whether the, the Chinese project is probably a government project. And so uh, gov governments can take big steps and, and do R&D type of projects and, and move ahead. But I think the utility industry is interested in having a, a product that is, um, well, not off the shelf, but at least is uh, that something that they're more comfortable with. And currently, these uh, high temperature gas reactors in the United States is, is not something that uh, people are, are uh, comfortable with. Still, more R&D is needed. So when you talk about <clears throat> New Scale or, or Babcock and Wilcox and their mm -hmm. modular reactors, what are they still coming in at $5,000 to $6,000 per kilowatt then? Is that the price target? I haven't seen the the uh, the price target, but of course that five thousand or uh, sixty three hundred uh, dollars or, or whatever uh, it that that number varies depending on who you who you speak to. Sure. Um, I think at this point in time, some of those designs are um, at the conceptual stage where it is difficult to do a precise economic assessment of what the the uh, installed capacity cost would be. Well, let me follow up then on the on the regulatory part of this because there are a lot of skeptics on nuclear here in the United States just on the economic side. And Exelon has said uh, in the past that they can't finance a nuclear or can't make the economics of nuclear in the United States work unless ga natural gas is at least $8. And I didn't check the spot price today, but we're at about $2.60. Um, but all of that's separate and apart from the permitting process. Now, as I recall, in the new Obama budget, there's $700 million for modular reactor work. Is that for the NRC for licensing and, and understanding this technology, or do, what's the latest state of the budget in terms of uh, the Obama administration, which has been supportive of the modular reactor de uh, developments? It has been it has been supportive, and, and I, I don't know uh, what the exact dollar amount uh, as, as you said, but uh, those those dollars will prim primarily go to the uh, to industry to support their efforts, and if some of those efforts are uh, do involve uh, licensing, as I mentioned, TVA wants to submit something to the Nuclear Re Regulatory Commission on a small B and W reactor in 2013, then uh, some of that money would would be to support that licensing activity. But within the NRC itself, in terms of that regulatory process, do, do they have the, is, do they need different personnel to assess the modular reactors as opposed to the, to the large ones? Or is this the same, effectively the same technology and the same scientists can analyze it? No, actually the Nuclear Regulatory Commission started working on how they would do the licensing of these small modular reactors probably three, four years ago. And so they have evolved a process which uh, again an evolutionary process based on how they license the current fleet of reactors so they have a process in place for licensing these small modular reactors that is essentially already in place so that uh, is one less issue that the industry or utilities have to worry about sure so David Disney let me come back to you on on the issue of the economics then of, of coal um, because I think uh, you made a critical point, and, and David Muller, you did as well, about maintaining fuel diversity. Um, uh, and, and we had, as, as Lajlo Varro said in the last panel, uh, the late 1970s where the U.S. actually prohibited the use of natural gas in uh, electricity generation, which he rightly said was a textbook example of what not to do in terms of energy policy. And in fact, that, uh, that, that uh, ruling, uh, that congressional, uh, 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 that bill that was passed by Congress effectively uh, allowed coal to, to dramatically grow its, its uh, market share in the U.S. to the exclusion of natural gas. But now, as, as David and uh, both of you pointed out, we may be overreacting and saying, okay, well, gas is the only way forward. So how do you compare then the economics of supercritical coal? Um, and perhaps you can explain to us the difference between supercritical plants and, and, and the, the standard pulverized coal plants. Now, how do the economics of supercritical and even ultra supercritical plants compare to the existing fleet? And can you finance them? 
Well, I mean, many of these, um, you know, higher critical technologies, there are trade-offs like there are in any of these technologies. You'll pay a higher upfront capital cost for some lower operating costs, either on the O&M side or the efficiency side, which will lower your fuel use. And so those are the trade-offs. You know, the big challenges are, are twofold. Is One is the, the development of those and the, 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 the spread of those. How many utilities are out there using them and, and will they deliver? You know, we went through some experiments in the late 70s with some of these supercritical technologies, didn't quite get the same O&M benefits that we had anticipated seeing and, and had some problems with them and, and saw some return back to the, the subcritical type units. You know, are we going to see that thing, see that same kind of occurrence again on a foregoing basis? Uh, there are also challenges in, in developing any big capital project project anywhere in the United States. Uh, you go look at the AEP's experience in Arkansas right now, just the permitting process, and get in just the, the headaches that they went through in actually developing the plant, starting construction, and then finding out that there were considerable questions about their environmental permits, and at one point, having those permits pulled from them after they had already broken ground and actually already started to develop the plant. Uh, thirdly, as you as you expand time on many of these units, even though the, the on, on their face economics may, may, may justify some development, uh, commodity markets, even though over the last several weeks we've been, uh, you, you watch the financial press, we've been you know, talking about the demise of commodity markets. They've been relatively significant over the last couple of years in terms of their price increases. So you look at all the civil commodity components you need, like uh, cement, steel, copper, and other things that go into a big modern civil uh, application like a power plant, they've been increasing at double digit rates. And so you can find yourself, I know, I know we were building two sister units in Louisiana, same company, same everything. One had a fixed price contract and the other one didn't. One came in at $800 million and the other one was up to $1.4 billion and was only months behind in the development phase. And the, the $1.4 billion was the one that ultimately got canceled and the $800 million on the fixed contract got developed. So that can tell you just even, even up front how fast those costs can move and that risk. And so who bears that delta there with the $800 and the $1.4 billion? In Louisiana now, somebody in the ratepayers are paying the cost of that undeveloped capital piece. And so you know, in, or else, if you don't do that, who's going to build the plant? So it, it is a very big challenge right now, and, and, it, and it has big implications on who bears the risk associated with those developments. So, David Muller, so what is the, you, you mentioned the 800 uh, megawatt plant in Carolina and the 630 megawatt plant in Indiana. What is the cost on a, on a per kilowatt uh, for those new supercritical plants? Um, and, can you, and before that, can you explain what supercritical sure. is and how that differs and then how ult, what ultra-supercritical sure, is as well? Really, really what we're talking about is the temperatures and pressures that they operate at. And okay. so I think ultra-supercritical is sort of, it's kind of an arbitrary dist distinction, but ultra-supercritical is anything above 1100 C uh, steam temperature. And I think supercritical is above 900. I might have those about right. Um, and, and the purpose for going that way is the higher the pressure and temperature, the more efficient the plant. Right. So the, the fleet today, the, the subcritical fleet, is roughly 35 percent efficient. The uh, uh, supercritical get up, get up into the high 30s. The ultra supercritical get up into the mid 40s in terms of percentage. So that's the trade-off. And the, so you do have some uh, fuel cost savings at a minimum and, in theory, uh, O&M savings. The, uh, the cost is, well, it's, it's, it's hard to do a direct comparison, honestly, because we haven't built, uh, you know, we, well, we at Duke haven't built a subcritical plant for a while. Uh, now we've built the, the supercritical plant, and it came in actually on schedule and on budget. So from that perspective, it was uh, uh, very successful. Our IGCC plant in Indiana, on the other hand, uh, it was well over budget. And it was the first time that we scaled up that particular technology, that coal gasification technology, to that large scale. So that's a 630 megawatt plant. Uh, you know, I, I, it, it will be the largest in the world when it's built. The only other one that I know that's currently coming into operation is, and then there could be others that I'm not aware of, but there's one in Tianjin in, uh, in China that's 250 megawatts. So that'll give you a little bit of comparison there. Uh, so the problems with scaling are just uh, always underestimated. We had a number of engineering changes that happened, you know, kind of mid-construction. We had some of the same kinds of problems that David Dismukes just, just touched on in that, uh, you know, as, as, you, as you figure out that, gee, things aren't going to work quite the way we thought they were going to work and we have to re-engineer, there can be environmental, environmental impacts that then kind of send you back into that process. And so it can just be, it's just difficult to do the first of a kind uh, sure. of anything. So what were the per, uh, the kilowatt costs then on the supercritical plant, the one in Carolina, the 800 megawatt plant? Do you, you I recall don't those? I off the top of my head. I can, you know, if you want to let me look here through my materials, I've sure. probably got it with me, but okay. uh, maybe I'll do that while somebody else talks. And okay. Not, 
Well, so David Dismukes, can you talk about how the utilities then, uh, in general, uh, and of course, uh, David Muller, you can address this as well, but when these utilities are placing these bets, I mean, are they looking out, I mean, what's their time horizon? Are they looking at 20 years? Can, and, and, and what can they honestly do in terms of that, that kind of projection? Is, are, they, can, are they looking out 10 years, 20 years? What, is the, what are they generally estimating their, their, uh, their, their reasonable time horizon in terms of these big capital costs? Usually when you do these evaluations, and by the way, you know, I, I typically work and, and provide advice on, in, in a large part for state agencies that represent the ratepayers of a particular state. So I'm usually on the other side of the, of the table in these types of analyses. And when we're evaluating this on the on the behalf of the citizens for the state, you're typically looking at the life cycle cost of that particular plant. So if it's got a, a 30 to 35 year life, you'll be looking at essentially what we refer to as the net present value revenue requirements or the net present value uh, stream of, of financing that that plant needs relative to its, to its next best uh, competitors. So you'll compare that to nuclear, to gas, and to other things. And so yeah, it is a long-term analysis. And there are lots of sensitivities that go into that. As you can imagine, when you're doing sensitivities, those become subjective. And you know, what gas price do you assume for the future? Is it five dollars? Is it fifteen dollars? What type of volatility are you assuming in there? Uh, what are you assuming about capital cost development? Uh, what are you assuming about operating efficiencies? All these things come into play on those long time horizons. And when you're off by a little bit, it can really impact those overall net present values. Uh, you know, Loslo, Loslo was still was talking about earlier how, you know, with these big long-lived assets that take a long time to develop, you know, one or two years uh, of a mess up on your assumptions on development will really mess up those net present value calculations. It does not take a lot. So sensitivities are the way you do it. And at the end of the day, at, in the regulatory process, a, a lot of judgment will go into making that decision and policy calls about, well, we're not willing to take that bet. We're not willing to get out of proportion, as David talked, about with uh, with a particular fuel mix and we're going to go down this road and, and and some state regulators have done that they have been obviously the Bogle plant in Georgia has had regulatory approval for that and that was the, a prime reason for that uh, there are a number of nuclear units in Florida that are getting that kind of pay-as-you-go cost recovery approach uh, and Dave is absolutely right to them and when you look at the capitalization of these projects it's as much as the plant and service that you've got if not double that uh, so it is a, essentially a banking the company type proposition uh, there's some IGC uh, C units that are being and developed one in Mississippi and the one in Indiana that's got you know regulatory long-term uh, backing on that so it is a long-term it is a long-term decision-making process in the sense of the uh, analysis that we're looking at but it is a, a decision that's made here and today about what those long-term consequences are sure so for the utilities it makes perfect sense for them to say well we're just going to take the shorter term time horizon and the much lower capital risk and just build uh, uh, build gas plants because the, the it's much much more uh, conservative financial uh, approach that's the trap i think i think that's the trap because what happens then is you know just you make decisions based on that kind of instant analysis and then 10 years later the dynamics are different and you start getting disallowances and all kinds of other negative impacts because now things have shifted beyond that instant sure. decision making. Framework. Well, uh, David Diamond then, can you address that in terms of the, uh, you, you talked about TVA and obviously they have federal backing, but how, are, how, are, how can the backers of nuclear, and I'm a big proponent of nuclear, how can they make those economics more compelling or is there all, necessarily going to have to be that strong government backing throughout? I, I have a hard time addressing that. Maybe David would be uh, more suitable to address that because... Um, because you work for the government. Yeah. No, 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 no. <laughs> uh, well, and, and not for a, a utility that is in a position to have sure. to make those decisions. But, but, okay, but you said, in fact, there, there was a, p a point where you said there was a smaller capital outlay for a modular reactor. So, yeah. but we're still talking in the five to th six thousand dollar kilowatt range, even for the modular reactors. Is that a reasonable assessment or a reasonable guess in terms of what these the, the capital cost would be for these smaller uh, units? Yeah, as as I as I said, I, I'm not sure exactly what the projected cost is, the capital cost. Uh, you know, what's more. I, they certainly need to be somewhat competitive with the the um, um, uh, alternative energy sources. But what's important, as you said, and and I think everybody has emphasized, is the fact that you don't need a large capital outlay, which is always a, a difficulty for these utilities. And the pay-as-you-go 
uh, approach that uh, David just mentioned, say in, in Florida, is is not uh, the situation in many states. So it, uh, the situation does vary from utility to utility, state to state, um, uh, regulating. Uh, regulatory body to regulatory body. Sure. Just to add on that, I mean, the importance of these these low cost government loans and the loan backing allows you to essentially kind of change your capital structure that you apply to this. So rather than being, let's say, 50 50 equity and debt finance, you can leverage the debt component a little bit higher, which is a lower cost. Uh, rate capital, and you can uh, you know lower that overall carrying cost associated with these developments, which can have a very big impact, as you heard on the first panel, with regards to the overall cost of financing these projects. For something as big as nuclear, for instance, that could be as much as a quarter of the overall ca cost that gets you know amortized over the next 30-year cost recovery period. So it is a big cost component, and can significantly change the the, the, um, the net present value calculations on whether to choose that versus choosing something else. It will bring those projects a little closer together. It's not going to bring them all the way together, particularly with today's gas prices, uh, but we'll start moving those a lot closer. Sure. Well, let me just pull out, I'll just ask one more question and we'll go to the floor. And it's one that I think is particularly relevant now with all the, the discussions about possible military action against Iran. Um, and it's something, David, that your colleague and I, Bill Horak, have talked about. But it's given that nuclear is now internationalizing, it has been really and uh, since uh, the, the early 50s, what is the mechanism, or is there a mechanism for the U.S. In, to take the lead and to really strengthen the IAEA with regard to uh, the the spread of of of, of, uh, of nuclear power? Because this is a key issue, obviously, uh, in Iran. It will be key for the UAE uh, all over the world. It, it, I mean, this is the the key challenge, isn't it? And it's the one that Eisenhower laid out in in Adams for Peace in the fifties. We're still really dealing with the same issue now today, are we not? Uh, yes, yes, we are. Uh, Non-proliferation is certainly an aspect uh, that, that touches on nuclear energy, and the International Atomic Energy Agency is the body that is responsible for monitoring and, and inspecting nuclear facilities around the world. Uh, the primary support for the IAEA does come from the United States. I don't know what percentage it actually is, but certainly in the area of non-proliferation, it is a majority support from the United States. Um, of course, although the United States may have policy objectives to improve the IAEA's ability to, uh, to monitor nuclear material, as the recent experience in Iran shows, this is uh, um, not an easy thing to do, and uh, if a country is not going to cooperate, as the IAEA has stated Iran is not willing to do, then um, the system kind of falls apart to some extent. Does that figure into any of the operations that you've had at Duke, David, or is that really outside of the fuel cycle and what your, your dealings in China is outside of what you're really thinking about in terms of being a privately, uh, privately held company, or not uh, as a public company? Yeah, we we focused really pretty specifically with our interactions with with Chinese partners in the nuclear arena. We have trained some of their operators in in our plants here. We've worked with them to to uh, move them toward uh, membership in the World Nuclear Organ, uh, you know, the World Association of Nuclear Operators, the Institute of Nuclear Power Operations. Uh, so so we've really kind of operated on that level with them, uh, uh, as opposed to more direct. Uh, Hands on well, the technology right. exchange and right. and right. Okay. And can I? Uh, yes, of course. Put an addendum to what I said, although you, you know, I we switched to a sort of a different topic, non-proliferation. Uh, I want to emphasize that that uh, concern with non-proliferation has more to do not with the uh, operation of a of a nuclear power plant, but with the operation of uh, uh, fuel fabrication facilities. In sure. the case of Iran, the concern is over their ability to enrich uranium in these centrifuge plants. So it, it really is a separate issue from the, the question of uh, nuclear energy as part of the no, electrical the, sure. capacity. And, and, and a fair point. And, yeah. and uh, I'm glad you made that distinction. I've, but as we, one of the, in looking at modular reactors, there's a lot of discussion about the potential to, for them to go to, into Africa and other parts of the world. But that's going to necessarily require, it seems to me, a greater emphasis on controlling the, 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 the nuclear fuel supply chain and uh, all of that that necessarily brings up the question of proliferation and, and so on. So, and dirty bombs and uh, potential for that. So, uh, let me open up to the floor. Uh, please, uh, uh, Debbie, uh, Marty Snyder has a question here in the front. Uh, 
Marty Snyder from uh, NYU. And I'd like to ask Dr. Diamond a question, uh, just based on his superior knowledge. Are, are you familiar with any activity in the world to build uh, Gen 4 pebble-based reactors or to build hybrid waste burners, which would have real uh, relevance for the proliferation issue? Uh, as far as hybrid waste uh, generators go, uh, this, this would be a, a reactor which has a d dual purpose of eliminating some of the, uh, what we call actinides in the waste. These are uh, potentially uh, nuclear materials that could be uh, redirected towards uh, weapons. But I, I think that idea of, of uh, burning waste is a, uh, is a research idea and I don't think anybody is seriously pursuing it. Uh, your other question, um, yes, the pebble bed reactor. In, in the United States, we are not pursuing that technology. And as a matter of fact, this was recently made clear in a decision this year um, <clears throat> by the Department of Energy on, on what type of high temperature gas-cooled reactor to pursue, and it's not the pebble bed type, but I think um, looking around the world, the, uh, the South Africans had a large project in there in, in that technology, and that's been canceled. Uh, the Chinese, I think, still do have projects that use that type of technology. So uh, as in a lot of things uh, that we've mentioned today and, and that you can read about in the newspapers, we're waiting to see what the Chinese come up with. Let me just follow up on that one real quick, um, because I know this is something of the work that's being uh, done at Brookhaven, and I know the Indians are very active in this. Can you just briefly give us a rundown on what's happening with uh, thorium-fueled reactors and whether you view that as any uh, a, a real viable technical or technological option now? Uh, thorium, rather than uranium in, in reactors, is meant to decrease the proliferation potential of reactors. Uh, a, a normal uranium fuel reactor does produce some plutonium-239, although uh, which can be used in a weapon, but uh, it is uh, extremely difficult to, uh, uh, to access from a reactor. Nevertheless, the use of thorium might uh, even eliminate that small potential threat. And there has been a lot of research at, at Brookhaven and in Russia and in other places around the world. Um, it has remained with us for many years. Um, and I, I think it, the, the interest has been steady, but never growing, so. Okay, fair enough. Yes, Laszlo. Uh, roughly half of the United States has vertically integrated regulated utilities where the Public Utility Commission can have a decision to maintain diversity, to invest in coal, because in a different scenario, gas well, can play a different role, invest in nuclear and so on. The other half of the United States has uh, uh, competitive wholesale markets for electricity uh, and merchant generators. Uh, do you think we will see a divergence in investment patterns between the regions, depending on the regulatory structure? Well, I mean, obviously, it's a, a much more difficult proposition when you don't have a guaranteed customer base and you're in one of these retail choice states that are vertically, you know, separated, uh, where the distribution and transmission operations are regulated by state and federal regulators and the generation portion is still, you know, competitive. But I think if you look at any big solid fuel resource, uh, even in those competitive states, either there's going to be a longer-term tie-in arrangement into a basic generation service auction, uh, which, which uh, provides electricity to the customers that don't choose. So in many of the residential segments of that market, you see probably less than 10 percent of that market actually choosing to use an alternative provider and instead staying with the incumbent utility. So, you know, that 90 percent share could still, even in a competitive market, be dedicated to a longer term contract. Uh, and, and then in many other states that are vertically integrated, it's just a direct decision that, that's made by them. But one way or another, you know, there's some tying arrangement. Uh, I think even in the instance with uh, Exelon and with NRG, which are two 
uh, merchant power plant developers that were in Texas that are uh, that is a, a retail choice state, a vertically separated state. Uh, they were looking at long-term contracts with other municipalities in the state uh, to back up some of those. The South Texas project, I think, in particular with NRG, they were looking at some of their clients taking on some additional long-term contract pieces. So one way or another, you either do it through regulation or you do it through contracting in those markets. But one way or another, you've got to have a 30-year commitment. Uh, I think the one difference, though, and it was never clear to me, for instance, on the merchant side, is these pay-as-you-go mechanisms uh, were, were ones that were not clear to me that, that 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 would be an approach that would be used in those particular instances, whereas in the vertically integrated markets, you, you do tend to see that most of the time. I'm not familiar with anywhere where that hasn't been the case on some of these very big new technologies, particularly at those scales that we're looking at. Uh, just to make one quick point on NRG, the... Uh they had proposed to build two more reactors at the South Texas project in uh, Bay City, Texas. <clears throat> the city of Austin uh, owns 16 percent of the existing plant, and NRG came to Austin and said, "We, you know, are you interested in buying in?" And the city of Austin said, "No." Uh, the city of San Antonio said yes, and then there were very quickly the cost estimates on the project uh, increased by 20, 30, 40 percent, and then the city of San Antonio. Uh, pulled out, and now NRG has effectively canceled the project and said they're not going to go forward. Uh, so that's a little bit of the background on that. So, uh, uh, yeah, sure. Uh, Debbie, right there in the back, and then I'll come to you next. Thank you. <coughs> or either way. Uh, J.P. Donlin, Chief Executive Magazine. A fellow named I think Bob Murray, who runs his own coal-based energy company, told us recently that there is a, quote, war on coal, citing firstly the present administration, but also uh, members in, co uh, in Congress and the Senate like uh, Nancy Pelosi and Steny Hoyer. Uh, and given the fact that uh, there seems to be a very pronounced uh, anti-coal campaign, I remember uh, standing on a metro platform in Washington, D.C. and saw these uh, Florida ceiling uh, uh, advocacy posters that it basically equated clean coal with unicorns, leprechauns, and alien sightings. So uh, given that your subject here is technology, is there any technology present or in the wings that would change the perception, possibly, of coal politically, if not you know, scientifically? David Muller, how about? It's tough for technology to change perception, is my, would be my first response. But uh, if we look back to the uh, materials that Jacob, or we're in the package from Jacob, uh, he, he's got a, a bar graph that shows the decline in emissions from different technologies. And if you look over on the, the uh, right-hand side of that graph, uh, the emissions, with the exception of CO2, actually do become uh, vanishingly small with with the newer technologies like IGCC, CO2 is 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 I think the remaining issue that's uh, really yet to be solved. Uh, someone this morning earlier mentioned that carbon. Uh, I think it was Laszlo actually that CCS carbon capture and sequestration. He's not so sure that's going to happen quick or quick or at all. Uh, it and it really is a challenge. So I think CO2 is the is the wild card there. But that that graph will give you a real good picture of. How it's how it's come down. So just uh, quickly on the IGCC, so you have effectively no mercury emissions then from, so that's all captured in that in the coal gasification process. But what about the ash issue then? How do you manage the? Because this is one of the things with the, the the accident in Kingston, Tennessee, the TVA plant, right? That has really brought federal regulation on coal more more uh, brought even yet more attention on the coal business. Do, do you have any? ash advantage on IGCC relative to regular pulverized coal? Well, you do in that some of the stuff that would have gone into the ash comes out up front. So there's, there are less, <laughs> quote, pollutants in the, in the ash because you've taken them out before you've actually had the combustion process. So the heavy metals then are, come out before uh, and are separate from the ash? Some, some elements do, not, not all We have them. to define what you mean by <laughs> heavy, heavy metals. I mean, it, it's uh, not everything comes out. Some stuff comes out. So, so on a on a gross on a gross level, the ash is cleaner than if you just burn the coal directly. And so then, and, and from a technological standpoint, then how do you handle if you the, some I don't know the process. The mercury precipitates out. Then you have to handle that separately, and then you have disposal issues for that segment of the waste stream that you have to deal with separately from the ash. It's 
uh, the mercury is taken out in different processes, not as pure mer mercury. It's, it's combined with other elements so that it's in different forms. I see. Okay. Uh, yes, this gentleman in the back there. Hi. Itai Carelli, Greenland Technologies. Actually, to build on the gentleman's last question, um, given the uh, recent EPA uh, cross-state air pollution and uh, um, uh, rules and the uh, new uh, proposed um, standards for hazardous uh, air pollution, PJM, for instance, estimated that, uh, I don't know, 20,000 megawatts should be retired pretty quickly and, um, and puts the cost of some of the retrofitting on, on, on coal power plants at about $800 a, uh, a kilowatt. Uh, or something like that. I mean, cost prohibitive. I don't remember the, ex the exact numbers. How do you, um, um, in the, I guess not in the perception, but in terms of operations, how do you uh, reconcile the retirement or the the uh, uh, cost effectiveness of retrofitting those plants based on these EPA rules, um, given the uh, mix that uh, David Moller mentioned? Sure. Well, I mean, first, the first thing I want to highlight is if, if with things like the cross state air pollution rule. There, it, it is the case that those types of, of rules are going to prejudice coal-fired generation, and it, I think it is also the case that you're going to see uh, accelerated retirement of a number of those units as a consequence of those rules. And I think the thing to keep in mind, too, with these rules is, particularly with the administration's response on some of the, or at least EPA's response, is that the impacts are not as significant uh, for that individual rule. And, and one of the things you need to keep in mind is that we're looking at a series of rules coming out right now that are all coming out in tandem that all utilities are going to have to uh, respond to and are going to have to abide by. And if you look at those rules in in, in conjunction with one another, in, in total, you are likely to see some some significant retirements. Now, what does that impact? Well, it's probably some. And, and what does that impact? Well, first of all, it's not always the case. It's only coal. I I work and live in Louisiana and, and, and advise the state, and we were one of the 21 states that filed suit uh, against EPA on the cross state air pollution rule alone. And one of the things that we found was it was going to be shutting down a lot of our older uh, natural gas fired generation that was still steam. It wasn't combined cycled. Uh, generation. Generation. And it was down in areas of South Louisiana, as you can imagine, where we don't have lots of lines running around in swamps and bayous that you've probably seen with swamp people on TV. <laughs> well, we don't have lots of lines down there. We've got pl power plants down there. If we have to shut those down, there's, you know, greater New Orleans area may not be getting power in the summer. And so there are big reliability issues associated with that that go beyond just coal generation. So, you know, how to, and, it's, and it's usually a, a class of generators of both gas and uh, coal, primarily coal, that are impacted by this. And these are your, your older plants that are in the 30 to 50 year range, age range, or maybe a little older. They don't have as many controls as some of the larger bulk newer plants do. Uh, we use them in uh, various different dispatch capacities, more in a cycling, load following capacity. They'll be running the steam the generator uh, the boilers will be going but we'll you know connect the generators up and down for load following in those instances they're very economic and if you think about the economics of this and the capital cost of these plants again you're balancing capital and fuel and efficiencies all at one time um, these things have been on the books probably for 30 years. They have 30-year tax lives. They've probably been depreciated in large part. The carrying costs and the capital costs that are on the books are relatively low for these, but their remaining life in service is not very long. So if I'm going to go in and take another two, five, eight hundred dollar a KW investment for controls and put it on an asset that's already 35 to 40 years old, that switches the economics. I never, I cannot recover it over the remaining life of that plant. And so what do I do from the economics perspective? This plant still likely has a lot of usefulness to me as a utility. It certainly even as, you know, standby I could use it, but yet I can't justify that incremental new control investment as a consequence of that. And I certainly can't <laughs> afford it in the time frame that some of these rules are envisaging, which for the cross state air pollution rule starts you know, this year was going to start this year, and for uh, for ozone season states, it was going to start in May of this year. So it's it's a very quick amount of time to react to this uh, with a very high cost. And so when you've got that uncertainty, what do you do? You, you shut those plants down. And those estimates, to put those into perspective, uh, range anywhere from a low of about 35 gigawatts or 35,000 megawatts up to as high as I've seen some estimates up to 75,000 megawatts. And I think there was some announcements this morning on, on a utility in up here in the mid-Atlantic region, I think, that was announcing they were shutting down about 3,000 megawatts megawatts as a consequence of these rules. So you're seeing these add up, add up quite quickly. But David, aren't those rules now under li in litigation? Or is, what's the status of that litigation now? Do you know? Uh, it's going to the appeals court right now on the cross-state air pollution rule, and uh, they have stayed. U.S. Uh, US court right, appeals, yeah. And they have stayed the initial phase of this, and they'll be the court will be decided soon. Gotcha. Who's next? Yes, uh, right here. Debbie, thank you. 
This is the last question. Yeah, we have three more minutes. Uh, my name is Tom O'Connor. I'm with the Department of Energy's Office of Nuclear Energy. I have uh, responsibility for the Office of Gas-Cooled Reactor Technology, just to provide a couple of clarifications. Uh, High-temperature gas-cooled reactors covers a range of temperatures. Uh, reactors have operated of this technology in the past in Germany, in the United States. Uh, the technology for 700 degrees centigrade, which is about 1,300 degrees Fahrenheit, there are no materials-related issues. If you want to operate at 1,000 degrees centigrade, then you've got some research that needs to be done. In terms of uh, the technology itself, it can be a pebble bed, as was the question was raised, or a prismatic block. A pebble bed, think of it as a gumball machine where the fuel is constantly removed from the bottom and put into the top. The selection that was made here recently wasn't made by the Department of Energy. The selection was made by the NGNP Industrial Alliance. And, and I want to highlight a bit of that for you because you may say, well, who is this Industrial Alliance? Uh, the Industrial Alliance, which chose a prismatic block reactor, is uh, a group of companies uh, comprised of uh, Dow Chemical, uh, the Petroleum Technology uh, in Canada, uh, ConocoPhillips, uh, SGL, which is a graphite company, uh, Westinghouse, Arriva, and a handful of other uh, technology companies. And they're interested in it because they see a need for integrating nuclear energy into other aspects of the United States energy picture. You've talked here today about nuclear and electricity, coal and electricity, natural gas and electricity. Well, that's only a fraction of what our country's energy situation is. You, we've touched on it some in terms of coal to liquids. But from a grander scheme of things, the Department of Energy, my office, uh, the Office of Nuclear Energy, feels that nuclear energy can be expanded into other applications within the United States, principally industrial applications, providing the high temperature process heat source for oil refineries, uh, for the conversion of coal to liquid, uh, conversion of coal to liquid in a manner that doesn't, uh, doesn't produce any CO2 emissions, which, you know, when you look at, you know, our, our overall energy situation, yes, I think it's great that we're able to export natural gas. I think it's great that we're able to export coal. But on the other hand, how does that economically offset the fact that we're importing almost 10 million barrels of oil a day into this country and the associated dollars that are going out of it? I would suggest that nuclear energy could further reduce the amount of oil imports in order to take advantage of our indigenous carbon resources that we have, whether it be natural gas, coal, even biofuels. Fair enough. Well, I think that's a good uh, uh, ending point. Uh, I promised we were going to end at, at 11, and we are doing so. Please join me in uh, giving a big round of applause to the, to the Davids here. It was a very good panel. And, uh, and, and, and thank you all for coming, and uh, we'll be here for a few more minutes. So, uh, uh, again, great conference. Thanks for, thanks for coming today. I think it is clear how fortunate we are to believe in the power of ideas. To apply the common sense and the fresh thinking to the Manhattan Institute.